Hi guys, how you going? Right, this is an autism video, as you can tell by the title, but it's not just for autistics, it's for people that maybe want to know about autism, or, I don't know, you yourself just need to know more about your autism. Trust me, I'm still learning about my own autism by experiencing like whether it's through a book or a video a vlog or whatever i am learning so much um continually never ends i guess that's the same for everybody right still got my my friend um it's already like it's a 28 day bug so they choose what how many days they put it on it can be three it can be seven can be 28 whatever all right you're gonna go in your little fort cats are so autistic aren't they <laughs> right so he's in his fort so do you like my hello kitty ball this is the visual stim i'm trying to provide a nice and i've got my favorite thing on today it's very cold in perth um 12 degrees and raining out there right now but i'm still tempted to go for a swing <laughs> Right, so basically, I want to explain the things that I've learned about autism, and I've also got a few things to share to put in your toolbox. So this is for, um, it's for anywhere. I mean, you could use it for a workplace, you could use it for school, if it's for a child, you could use it for so many things, but I, being that I'm, physically disabled with my autism. I have 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome and I have, because of that, autism ADHD. So I'm physically sick a lot. 22Q affects a lot of parts of our body, just under 200 parts of our body. And um, I have my immune system is bad, my heart is bad, my brain is bad. <laughs> I have Erlos Danlos syndrome as well. So basically, I have a lot to contend with. And what comes with, hence why apologies for being drugged up, I've had a very bad migraine. I've been struggling with my migraines. They're connected to my seizures. Um, they showed up in the MRI and that's how they explained it, is it's, that's what it shows. And um, they're linked. So when my medicine doesn't work effectively and that's caused it's inefficient for me for many reasons. I'm not even going to go into the list of it because it's too complex and I don't want to go off tangent. But basically, I um, don't always absorb my epilep for epilepsy, genetic seizures, because things happen and, the, and it lowers and then I get the migraines and then the seizures. Also, I have a speech impediment at the moment since the seizure. So please excuse any if it happens. So I have a toolbox to show you. But first I just want to share what I've learned about autism. And then of course, maybe you've never heard of it. Maybe it'll help. You may sort of know of it, but you don't know the name of it. How to explain it to others around you. It's very important to educate others. We need to be the educators because we know it best, right? Um, so... First, I'm going to talk about alexithemia. Alexithemia is a thing that I believe all autistics have, but they're just unaware. And it is a spectrum, so some might suffer worse and, and some might suffer less. Anyway, alexithemia is the inability to read your own body language Others can't read your body language, in other words. Sorry for not speaking correctly. Like I said, my brain is fried. So others don't know how to read our body language and they will misinterpret us. That happens so often. They get it so wrong because our body language as an autistic is different. So we cannot be read. Um, and if you want to know body language really well, Alan Pierce, great book. <laughs> I've read it with my studies, um, formal studies at TAFE and University a lot. He's highly recommended and he does know his stuff. And that's the only way I know body language is because of him. All the other stuff that he hasn't covered, 
mm -mm. right or if I forget things he, he said in his book I, I won't read it so I have the inability with Alexa thing here I can't read other people's body language so someone might be wanting to end the conversation and I won't know that's bad as an adult that sucks um they will try and you know put things across to me and and with body language all the non-verbals all the all the cues that are not word spoken I, I can't pick it up um and it's assumed by the other person that i can pick it up that is terrible so you've probably experienced that um and feel very misunderstood because the person is not getting you um, and because neurotypicals like to do a lot of communication non-verbally not a good situation right however it's funny how me being previous non-verbal autistic I can read some parts of a non-verbal autistic because of that so that's kind of weird but it helps so but basically lexithemia is also about emotions so for example I can be very kind of showing emotions and Sir will be like, what's going on? Because I won't attend to them because the alexithemia is the inability to pick up my emotions, to emotion, to do emotion, reg, is it emotion re regulation, emotional regulation, emotional or emotion regulation? <laughs> oh my God. Oh my goodness. Emotion regulation, I don't know what it's actually called, but regulating your emotions, right? We struggle with that as autistics because of our alexithemia. We don't know what we feel. We only know the basics, right? We can say we're happy, sad, mad, or glad. We don't really have a scope of, so basically what we need and what a great tool is, and if you've got a speech therapist, they'll probably do this with you. I have done this myself with my speech therapy. They will give you a list of feelings and you get to go, I think it's that one, that one, that one, and that one. And then you add a social story to those emotions. And then us autistics can go, ah, oh, okay. Now I can do my emotion, reg emotion, regulating my emotions. Far out. I feel really stupid right now. I'm, I'm not having a good day. I literally today had a moment. Uh, I was doing the budget. Forgot how to insert a line. I'm not doing good. And it was actually quite emotional because I, it threw me. It's something that I do practically every day and I couldn't suddenly do it so I got emotional anyway so I'm not doing well in the brain but basically alexithemia the best tools are things like that or emotions cards they're available online for children for adults pick what you think suits you or the person like the child there's plenty out there there is I got mine from um what is it sprout um something sprout and but basically anyway you'll probably show up when you do a search there are many places but do look at because some of them are rubbish okay so be careful of that trap of these companies that want to sell you these things and they think that it's oh yeah these are cards no make sure you get one that actually has a decent range of emotions and relevant to their developmental or mental age you must meet that criteria because there's no point in giving a child massive complex emotions cards or list of emotions to a child they can't do that yet so it has to be developmentally so really if you're autistic you should have access to speech therapists and this is exactly what they will do with you um, is help you to get that toolbox so that you can communicate very well with your about your emotions you can regulate your own emotions just in your own life um and then of course just remember to add in your little secret powers of go to your special interest i use my swing so 
So whatever that is, it's a sensory seeking thing. Um, go to your go-tos, right? Do that. Um, even if it's a thought, um, I go in my dark bathroom. It works for me. <laughs> um, do what you need to do. But basically, lexithemia is the inability to read body language, emotions, and it's tough. And it affects relationships, any relationship, and particularly with strangers, because they might see, like, read you very, very wrong. Um, so it's, it's, just, it's quite sad, really, and it's a struggle for us, and we do our best. And even us so-called high-functioning, which there is no such thing really, um, I know for myself, level two is not easy. Um, and I think that the people that work with me, it's always funny because I always see them when they first meet me because of my education it, that's gone so high um, with tertiary that they, they, they hear. And of course, growing up in a family that's affluent and, you know, they teach you to speak well. Okay, they teach you how to have conversations. That helps, that's great, but it covers the autism. So that's a problem because I'm sometimes falling into this pattern, not so much anymore, but I used to a lot with the, with the masking, is I would do those behaviors, but I wasn't happy because that wasn't being me. Um, it was all like being on a theatre stage show, which I've done before, um, going to a theatre arts high school. I've done a lot of acting um, shows and then dancing as well. There's sometimes in there you might have a, a, an emotional or a, a message in the dance that kind of is a story, right? So I'm used to that and that's what it felt like. And I got depressed. And when I was told, um, unmask, 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 that's not what the words he used, the person that diagnosed me, but I don't know what he said. It was something other description because that this was in the days when we weren't all aware. Um, social media wasn't talking about it. I was very isolated when I got diagnosed. There was nothing. And I just hid it for two years from everybody. Um, except for like one friend of mine. So basically, um, another thing that really gets in the way of, of functioning is dyspraxia. Dyspraxia I still have, which, you know, we get fooled, don't we, by some people, how they speak about us adult autistics that apparently, you know, it's, it's almost like we grow out of it. We don't grow out of it. We get better at dealing with the dyspraxia, for example. So dyspraxia is when you're clumsy, okay? You are uncoordinated. You might drop things. You might bump things. You might not navigate around areas and, and, and you know, I mean, I've got a massive bruise on my butt, on my butt, because I wanted to dust one day, just stupidly, like literally, I get, I, I'm so sick some days and I drag myself out of bed and I take all these ornaments off and I'm white because the dust was really annoying my OCD brain and I was like, I'm going to dust this thing and yes, I'm, I'm going to be out of breath and yes, I'm going to be landing in my be bed like I'm jumping over the pole at the Olympics and landing on that mattress and the high jump, right? That's how I land in my bed. Quite epic actually. And anyway, I've got a massive bruise because I can't navigate. Now, yes, some of that is my permanent ataxia, which I got from my first seizure. My first seizure, I had, um, I was getting six a day, and this went on for a long time. Uh, many ambulance trips, very traumatic for me, my children, and sir, um, until we learnt to manage them, and... I don't think they're any less scary, particularly for Sir, but I'm just used to it. Um, a bit complacent, maybe. That's probably not a good thing. But um, yeah, it's like after each seizure, all of my things are worse. So my dyspraxia, my ataxia. So ataxia is basically, if I did the sobriety test, heel to toe walk, 
I just fall to the side and literally fall on the ground. I cannot do it. So it's permanent ataxia. So one day when my neurologist, which will probably be a private in the end and someone that actually does the right job, I need them to write a report for um, a physio and see if I can do some work. Um, I'm going to look into hydrotherapy as well because it's always been good for me. And I love my water. I love my water. You guys know I love my water. So basically I'm looking into hopefully one day I will get a nice report that can go to my physio so I can learn. Hopefully I can't cure it through physio, but I can learn how to live with it, if that makes sense. So dyspraxia is, when I was a child, it was particularly difficult with drinks. So, you know, when you give your child cups, you know, they get to a certain age and every child has a cup. My brother's two years older than me. Not much difference, right? He was fine with the cup all the time. I don't remember him spilling a cup once, right? Me, I can't remember or count how many times I have spilled a cup of like cordial, water, um, pop, like fizzy drink can't count I can't count as a child um, and even as an adult doing housework I have probably can't even count that I have damaged things like ornaments vases just random things right I have damaged things by dropping them by with the clumsiness and just my brain just doesn't seem to it's almost like one day I had this vase and it just I, I was flicking my hands like almost like, look, I don't know if it's a stim or a tick, but I flicked my hand and the vase and, and I, I could just see it happening. And I was like, no. And at the time we had like this, you know, um, our house was beautiful, sort of really hard tiles, beautiful, big, solid tiles. And it just smashed. And this was after three hours of cleaning the house. And I was nearly ready to pick up the kids from school and I was like, the house is perfect. And I've got this beautiful snack ready for them after school. And now I've got glass all over the floor and I'm about to bring the kids home from school. So anyway, lots of things can go wrong. It's really problematic. It doesn't go away. It just lessens. Like I have less episodes of that kind of thing as an adult that as I did as a kid. So that's really hard. Um, also, just the, the uncoordinatedness and just the awkwardness of doing things. It doesn't bother me because I'm used to this because I've always been like this, right? Um, I've embraced it now, and particularly since not straight away when I was diagnosed. It took me a while to accept it. I was ashamed at first. I'm not going to lie. I was not... Um, it kind of like I was trying to kill that side of me ever since I grew up I was like oh that autistic little girl is just she's so just a failure and she can do nothing and everything she does she gets it wrong and I wanted to be a different person to that person until I grew up and realized that is me and I have to live with certain things there's certain things you can improve and change and other things you've got to accept so I've learned to accept it, but it's awkward. For example, I have someone over for coffee. I'm making the coffee. They don't like how I do the coffee. They want to come and intervene because they see my awkwardness, which I'm fine about, but they want to take over because they think that I'm doing it wrong because I'm doing it differently. And I don't like that. But neurotypicals do that all the time. Um, so my advice, if you're a neurotypical, um, please just, if it's difficult for the autistic, let them do it. And don't judge. Don't say anything. Don't judge. Make them feel like it doesn't matter. So long as the coffee is good. And the coffee is always good at the end. Don't you worry about that. I'm a good coffee maker. But I'm just saying. You interrupt the process for that person. You're taking their independence away and you're taking their self-esteem. You're notched down. Now, self-esteem is fluid, okay? 
our self-esteem ebbs and flows. It's not a solid thing. You can't just go and earn it and it stays. It can, it's fluid. Um, and so that knocks the self-esteem of an autistic. When you step in, I don't care if it's like they're putting a plant in the ground and you don't like how they're doing it, right? Just don't say anything. Just leave it. Even if it's like, you know, you redo it later if it's your house or you, if it's the autistic person's house and it doesn't work out, they will learn. So let them learn. I'm a big believer in that. Um, I'm an X generation and I'm, I'm mixed with therapies for autism. I think there's a certain amount that's perfectly needed. I needed my informal ABA that my mother gave me. Um, and I guess my father and my grandparents on both sides kind of ABA'd me. They taught me noticing and aunties and uncles. I have a lot of aunties and uncles and they would see the struggle and step in and say, this is how you do it, blah, 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 blah. Mm. And I, they'd go through, it's kind of like ABA because this is days of, they didn't have that. They didn't have that in Australia. Um, so basically that level of therapy to a certain point is great, but then there's a point where you've just got to let them be them. Um, and you've got to be realistic about what their full potential is. I've had to accept what my full potential is and I have coexisting conditions, which is really annoying because I don't just have autism ADHD. Like I said, 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome means I have heart brain problems, immune system problems, skeletal problems, <sighs> too many specialists to count, um, and life expectancy is not the same as everyone else. So I don't have the same life as everybody else. There's more complex stuff on top of autism. So, you know, there's just... There's just Dyspraxia basically, that's an acceptance thing. It does improve. So if you've got a child that is just a nightmare with keeping things tidy and, and I'm going to get into executive functioning now, just two seconds, <laughs> but basically dyspraxia, if they spill things, when my son, who's autistic, would spill something, make a mistake, and I could clearly see, even though I'm suspicious that my other child is not just ADHD, but possibly autistic, because um, he's uh, gifted. Um, but basically, my oldest is autistic, diagnosed. And um, with him, when he would make a mistake, I saw his self-esteem just sink. So I would always be like, oh, it's okay like it was an accident you know like we all make mistakes and accidents let's clean it up or if it was too young I'd say look you go and play you get out of the way of the you know say if there's mess of liquid or whatever um mummy will clean it up it's okay and I would always make sure and then after cleaning up I would go and check on him again and just observe what he's up to. And if he's looking a bit, mm, I would say something, you know, like, it's really okay what happened. Don't worry about it. Mummy's not upset about it. It's okay. It was an accident. Um, so, yeah, there's there's that kind of thing. You can see the disappointment. And every it's a bit like when I was in special ed. The teachers used to look at me when I'd say, Oh, I can't do it. I'm so stupid. Because to them I would speak. Because these people, I'm telling you, in my country, in that era, special education teachers, which were not formally trained, we don't get the proper teachers. Isn't this funny? We don't get the proper teachers. We get the lower educated teachers. But anyway, that's another... That's another argument with the Australian government I'd love to have. But anyway, welfare worker, sorry, politics, it, it just it just always comes up for me. And late diagnosed people need to be diagnosed and girls need to be diagnosed at all age groups. For goodness sake, wake up Australia. Anyway, so basically, 
um, you know, I actually think that the, the biggest learning is through your mistakes. And, you know, I've made a lot of mistakes along the way. But people have not accepted those mistakes because of my autism. Um, and what, what I mean by that is being late diagnosed, even though my family would not have been, not be surprised because they knew my difficulties, they were there and they stressed about it, struggled about it, were scratching their heads about what is wrong with this kid all of the time. I heard the words about, is this kid going to be okay? Seriously, that's what I heard. I have, I had two families and I'm not judging my families in, in that negative way, but it's a thing. When there's affluence, they want normal. They don't want something that's someone, something, isn't that terrible? Even putting myself down. They don't want someone that's challenged. And it's quite sad. Um, there's no room for accommodations. And when I spilt drinks, I was punished. So when I spill a drink now, now I hope that because of what I did with my son, that when he makes mistakes, that he's like, I have seen him stressed even as an adult because he lived at home to about 24. I mean, he moved out a few times, but you know, friends and things sometimes then go and move other places and they come back home. That's just normal. Um, but you know, pretty much till 24. And even as an adult, you know, he would stress over things. And I'd be like, you've got it, dude, you've got it. And he did have it, but autism, we come with a lot of doubts because we spend a lot of our childhood getting it wrong, having embarrassing moments. And as much as even me saying to my autistic son, it's okay, like you're getting it wrong, but it's okay. And then my situation being, I would be punished for everything I got wrong. It's really, it doesn't really matter which way it's done. We all with autism struggle with self-esteem. And I really want you to really look at that if you're autistic and say, I'm going to cut that out. I'm going to stop beating myself up for having autistic struggles because you're autistic okay and you're going to have problems you have been tricked by society including a lot of therapists not all not all um that you are growing up now and we've taught you everything and you're okay but yeah like i was saying about special ed teachers they are just beautiful people and I really felt like I could be, I guess, autistically me, basically. I didn't have to mask when I was in that little group. And there's about six kids and about three teacher aides, basically. So it's like two to one ratio, I guess you could say. And, um, but when I would make a mistake, and we'd be sitting there and I'd be doing the blocks and doing the maths and I'd be, <laughs> you know, and with the ethnic in me, Okay, it's in there. My father has it too. It's fiery side. We get fiery and we get so like, even my grandfather was the same. It's like especially at the footy. <laughs> but basically I get very frustrated. And they would always say, It's okay. Same thing as what I said to my son. It's okay. You're eventually going to get it. It's just gonna take time. And that's why I urge anyone that works with autistic or just know an autistic and you're around them, let them make the mistakes and help them after the mistake. They will learn from those mistakes. But make sure that developmentally and looking at their spectrum where they are, that it suits that. It's a bit like children. You don't expect an 11 year old to drive a car, so don't expect an autistic to of a certain level of, of the spectrum or a certain area of the spectrum to go do something that they're saying to you, I can't do that. Um, and with 22Q, a lot of IDD problems come into this. So 
autism has coexisting conditions that not all autistics have, but I do. And IDD is part of my struggle. Um, and being 50, but mentally 18 to 21, is the hardest thing to be in a society that's so judgmental on invisible, invisible, you know, conditions. Um, it's terrible. And um, it's, it's really hard because when I don't comprehend a way that they think a 50 year old should comprehend and people look at what I'm into, what I collect and judge that. But I'm, I, I'm still an adult. I am an adult. Um, and so infantilizing an, aut an autistic that also a lot of autistic ha do have IDD, that is discrimination and it's not nice to do. And it's not letting the person be themselves. And I think that that is damaging to not just the self-esteem, that's damaging to the person. And I know that neurotypicals want acceptance for their flaws, for their good parts and for whatever. And so do autistics. They deserve accommodations. They deserve to be understood about where they're on the spectrum and whether they have coexisting conditions, whether it's the physical, like, you know, I've got physical, whether it's my IDD, my mental age, socially, that is difficult. I'm around sometimes my peers and I don't comprehend what the hell they're talking about. People can be so much younger than me, they could be 30 something, and they might comprehend something way better than me or act all way more mature than me. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not like that. <laughs> I'm kind of like, I don't know, like what's, what's the thing? Um, I am an adult, but I mean like, I'm just not, sure there's times where I'm mature. I'm not saying I'm not mature, but I'm just saying like, I just don't have that seriousness. I will never be a serious person. And I don't think, you know what, if you look at a lot of our famous, famous comedians, actors, entertainers, ADHD, ADHD. We just have this thing where being serious is just, oh, it feels like sitting at school, you know, and you're looking at the clock and you go, it's nearly three o'clock, it's nearly three o'clock, one minute. Oh, 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 no, 30 seconds. Oh, it's about to turn. The bell's going to go at any minute. Oh, I'm free. I can be me. And I go home and let's be honest, as an autistic, clothes come off. Okay, that's a problem. My brother hated it. Hated it. I would just strip right down. I'm talking young child. And I'd have meltdowns because I'd been at school. So many expectations on me probably too much, couldn't really handle the whole thing, I'm exhausted, overloaded, I have no sensory downtime, I want to play with the kids in the street, but at the same time I want to be in my room and just be like decompressing, I guess you could call it. I've got a brother, so I've got to put up with him, so if I'm in the kitchen and he's in the kitchen getting a snack, then you know, sometimes there'll be a fight, because it's like, you, you know, you sib you're not siblings alike, you're fighting over everything, you know? Hurry up with the cordial, I want the cordial. Mm -hmm. I'm having the cordial right now, I'll take my time. And then they go really slow and they look at you like, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna annoy them. You know, that's sibling behavior. And it's really hard because being late diagnosed and being in my era of being autistic, um, and I don't blame my brother because it was an era, he would call me a retard. But that was my autism he was talking about. I don't blame him for using that word because in those days, that's what people used. Um, but basically, he could see the struggle. Um, and when I was younger, he would help me a lot. Um, he was very protective. He was very, yeah, pretty much like someone just navigating me through. Um, and then that kind of 
stopped at some point naturally because that's just what siblings do. I mean, especially to boy, girl, you know, we were close, but you know, he's a boy, I'm a girl, different interests, different friendships, that kind of thing. So basically, you know, um, having a mental age that's much younger, as you can imagine, when I was younger, that was tough. And when I became a mum at 20, Catholic upbringing, I was told all you're really kind of supposed to do is get married and have kids. You don't need an education or, in other words, a career. You just get married and have kids. And I don't regret having kids. So don't take it that way. But I do regret not having the opportunity through my family. And I remember begging to go to TAFE with the papers in my hand and crying my eyes out because I'm begging because my friends are going to workplaces. They weren't going to TAFE, but they were going to work at fancy places. And my mum's like, nah, no, you're not going to TAFE. Um, and obviously because of my learning disabilities, she just didn't think I could do it. And I'm like, no, I can. And look what I did do afterwards. And I think she realized later that I could do it. And I remember at least she made the effort one um, graduation to come. Um, and a really special friend of mine, um, said, um, your daughter's a beautiful person and you should be so proud. Um, she was a lot older than me. Anyway, so that was really nice. And I hope that my mum heard that and I hope she was proud of me. She should be. Anyway, um, it's complex with my parents. <laughs> Having divorced parents, it just, things never work out for the kids of, of divorce. Um, so basically, you need to make sure that siblings are educated. And that's even in adulthood, even if it's a late diagnosis. I still think the family needs to have some kind of understanding of autism. And the things that come with it, the alexithemia. There's also a thing called facial blindness. I have this condition and it's so embarrassing. When I first got my license, and I, I, I grew up in Hillary's as a teenager. And all of my friends would shop at the same shopping center, right? And because there was only one sort of decent shopping center there. And we would all go there because we all used to walk there as teenagers to spend our money from working, you know, um, with our little jobs that we had as teenagers, right? And it was so fun. We'd buy like stuff from the body shop and, you know, all sorts of stuff. It was super fun to go shopping with friends, but I didn't get to do it as often as, as they did because I was dancing, performing, and I was always doing some kind of show somewhere on, on a weekend. So yeah, that was sort of my, my um, special interest, which I was extremely over enthusiastic about. And everybody knew me as Diane the dancer at high school, that's for sure. Um, but basically, I think that education about things and in facial blindness, I would go to the shop and everybody I knew in this area, because in those days, Perth was small, everybody knew everyone. So I would see parents of my friends, I would see my friends, teachers even. Oh, that's really awful. I don't like that one. That was awful. Didn't like bumping into teachers. It's kind of like, hi. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, we had it at Hillary's Marina. We used to we used to jump off the um jetty, and there's a there's a jetty that you jump off. They still do it, but we started it. Okay, we I am a pioneer of that that place. I need to go do that again, actually, don't I? But I don't know if I'm allowed medically. But anyway, you jump off this little um thing and all of us used to meet there and hang out on a friday right and we'd jump off the jetty in summer and climb back up the ladder because there was plenty of ladders there and we'd all meet together and hang out at hillary's marina but then we found out that the teachers were at the pub just right there where they could see now it's um a chocolate tea place but 
and they moved the tavern somewhere else. But anyway, it was great days. But basically, people need to know, because I used to see them in the distance, and they'd be like, Diane, Diane. And they're, and they're like coming up to me, and this was happening all the time. And they're like, couldn't you see me? And I'm like, oh, hi, Leanne. Like, I recognize you. Oh, you're here. And they're like, yeah. Because see me, I'm expecting, you're at school. You shouldn't be here. I can't take this in. So facial blindness is real. Even if I go to a place where they are and I know that they're going to be there, I still look at people. It is like a three second, it's like a three second, where am I? It's awful. It's awful because some people, I mean, some people don't even notice um, because people are so busy and whatever, they just don't notice. And other people do. And they think that I'm not happy to see them kind of a thing you know like last minute going oh hi you know like tolerating them and it's like no i'm literally taking three seconds to register the person standing in front of me whoever it is and then i go ah oh, it's you and that's nothing to do with whether i'm happy or unhappy to see a person basically nothing to do with that so facial blindness um if you have that problem look into it you you might now just be learning that you have that problem it is common in autism um and i know for me it's a big deal um and i know that it's it's it's, it's kind of not a big deal in real life when you think about it but to me it bugs me it's like how embarrassing like that was so and so and i just i could tell that they were offended and you can you can just tell because it's there's repetition of it you see it over and over and a lot of them verbalize it. Like, didn't you know, recognize me? Oh my God, are you off with the fairies? <laughs> so I knew that that was going on pretty quickly in my life. And um, yeah, it just sucks. Um, no. No, I think no. I will in a minute. Um, and also just the mental age. Like I said, that is my biggest struggle. Um, it's something that I think, you know, a lot of autistics need to actually check yourself whether you actually have that. So if you are really struggling, like really struggling, and they call you high functioning, um, and you are just not coping with the expectations, and you need accommodations, or you need assistance, or you need some you know, speech therapy, which is more than just... Speech therapy is not what you think it is. It is it just covers a lot of things, a lot of things. So please utilize that if you can. Try and get access to that. So I'll show you what my speech therapy set up for me for hospitalizations because that's normally the place where they need to quickly understand me because they are going to look at me and go, oh, it's a 50-year-old woman, blah, blah, blah. Yep, okay, I know what to do. No. My comprehension level is different. My social age, like I said, you know, my mental age is 18 to 21. So you're gonna see behaviors that you're gonna go, wow, you know, she's 50. Yeah, so I'll be at one of those, it would be a dream, wouldn't it, to, to really beat the stats, which is my goal, um, to be in an old age home and I'm, I'm gonna run a mark. Yeah, I'm going to run a mark. I'm going to stir everybody up. Everybody. Anyway, I've got a folder. And, um, yeah. It's pretty embarrassing, isn't it? Oh, look at me. So it has my name and my face. And it says, please read this booklet about me and ways to communicate. This is a binded, uh, just a folder with those kind of, Sliding so, so that you can take things in and out and change things when you need to. Say if you've got a new allergy all of a sudden, if you have mast cell like me, um, which a lot of people think that can't that can't exist with a failing immune system. That's my last blood test. I'm really neutropenic at the moment. Um, no, you can have mast cell, which also showed up in that same blood test at the same time. 
So anyway, I had a, someone comment, probably some bitter nurse that's like, you get a lot of bitter nurses commenting on um, channels that talk about um, disability or sickness. And they don't know disability. They're really, they're really quite ignorant to it. Some want to know about it. Some don't really care. But I'm just saying they can exist together. Yes. Especially when you have a rare syndrome that people know nothing about, but they think they know everything about. So I have this, and in this, and I rec recommend you make one, so make one. I know it's difficult to have your face on there, but that helps them to recognize you. Um, and the first page I have, how you can help me with communication. So it's the please do's. So I, I only say a few, because otherwise it will take too long. But speak clearly, slowly, one question at a time. And, um, I may not understand, please repeat. So there's things like that. So please do those things. And then please don't rush me to speak. Don't speak loudly at me. Not too much information at once. And don't stand too close. Because I'm autistic, right? I don't like strangers being too close. Um, it's just, I can't concentrate if that's happening. Because I'm so... Mm, if you're autistic, you get it. Um, I don't have to say any more. And things like I like to talk about, this is just in case you're stuck in hospital and they want to make you feel comfortable. You're awkward because you're autistic and they're awkward. Um, and so basically it's like, you know, my hobbies, resin art, acrylic painting, my pets, you know, my cat, that I do YouTube, that I'm a content creator and all the things I love to do and talk about. Easy, right? Positioning. So this is things like about the bed. So there's so many times when, say, my post-seizure and I'm very tired, out of it. I might have Todd's paralysis and can't move my legs. And there's different things here that basically um, I can point to if I want them to change the bed position so that I can be comfortable if I can't communicate. Um, so that's positioning. Then we have sensory information. So I'm autistic, please don't hug me. So there's a whole list about autism in there. Temperature, so I can point to all the temperature things that I might be feeling and it helps me, like I said, alexithemia. Mm. And sorry, let's talk about now as we go through this, interoception, interoception. I think I'll tell you that properly, interoception. That is the inability to recognize what's happening in your body. Autistics have to actually do mm, this is happening in my body and that's happening in my body and no, oh, I forgot to eat today. It's four o'clock and I forgot to haven't eaten anything. Yeah. So that's inter interception. Interception. Bloody hell. So basically, this helps you with inter interception because you can look at this and go, well, what am I feeling, right? You know, am I boiling? Am I cold? Am I sweaty? Am I wet? Am I dry? Do I need a towel, pillow, blanket? All that kind of thing. This is hospital related. You can make it related to, like I said, if it's a person for school, university, anything. You can make it personalized. And I recommend you do it with a speech therapist because they have that this natural brain to do this. I, I'm not a speech therapist. <laughs> so, personal background. So you just put in there um, different things. Oh, I've got to change my home address in there. Um, so yeah, it's got stuff in there about personal stuff. So it's got like, I'm not gonna show you because it's got my NDS reference number, my private insurance number, um, hospital file number, Centrelink number, all that kind of thing, Medicare number. So yeah, that's in there because of course when you're in hospital, sometimes if you've rushed, been rushed in by emergency, you don't have your purse. And if Sir's rushed home to get stuff, then at least I've got this to go, well here's the details you need, there you go. Then you've got carer advocate next to kin enduring guardian. He's my guardian with 22Q, 11.2 deletion syndrome. From 18, you're supposed to have a guardian. It's supposed to be a parent, but my parents 
just don't seem to want to play nice with me. Um, I'm not wanted and um, that's just how it is. It wasn't my choice. They made it appear that way by doing certain behaviours to make it go a certain direction. That's what some people do. And you know what? I don't know why, but it just is what it is. And um, it's just not my stuff. It's something to do with them. Because me, I'm easy to work with personally. Um, but they want to be complex. They want to be nitpicking about things. And I'm just not there for that crap because life's too short. So, basically, but if they ever approached me, I'd be very, um, what do you call it? Civil, normal, okay? Because I don't have beef with anyone. Gosh, blimey, goodness Christ. Right, medical information. So, it has things like, and you, it's all individualized to you, falls risk, seizure risk, all of that. All my medical conditions are listed, that they need to know that. That's very important. Um, and then medications, very important. They're all listed, supplements, PRNs. PRNs is things that medication you take as you need it, not regularly. They're just like, say you've got a migraine, I need my certain migraine medication. If I'm having a seizure, I might need to up my levels of Eplum, so I'll add another extra Eplum per day, that kind of thing. Um, family medical history so i have that in there in case any you know that i have medication allergies now i'm going to redo this because this needs to be updated so you need to make sure you update it regularly so i'm going to have to do that food allergies and what you like to eat and drink and this is because of not only autism eating is a thing isn't it and when you're in a strange place it's a thing also i have gastroparesis problems there right then I need help with and you point to things showering walking um, communicating about how my body feels physically communicating dis discomfort and then there's an emotions chart that I can point to different emotions perfect easy um, then there this is a really good one when the specialist actually comes in and they want to know a lot about different parts of your body and you're like I just don't understand anything this is good this is what she provided me and i love it because it's helpful so i can show the doctors exactly where on my body it feels like whatever so that's really good and we have a scale chart which in australia they use similar one to this but this is modified for me because basically the stupid faces mean nothing to me because I have alexithymia. So I can't tell facial expressions. I get some of them mixed up with each other. So instead of that, we have a pain scale where we have green to orange to red. So I know that green means that I'm not too bad. Amber, orange means mm, something's alerting me, a little bit of pain. Then when it's in the red, it's like, ah, red, like red flag, oh, bad. Um, and then underneath the faces that I can't really read, because I have alexemia, it says no pain, mild pain, moderate pain, severe pain, very severe pain, worst pain possible. Simple, right? Because their chart for me does not work. Then I have time, month, week, days. Um, yeah, that kind of thing. That really... Yeah, so these are things like I can say to them, if I'm non-verbal particularly too, can you wait a minute please? Can you come back later? Now, question mark, later, question mark, how long, question mark, what time, question mark, so I might want to know the time. Um, and then there's the basic, yes and no. <laughs> so if I'm not in a good pain state and I'm wriggling around and I'm just not in a good space, I can point to that. So that's basically that. Highly recommend seeing a speech therapist for that. And then if I don't take my iPad, then I have my communication book in old-fashioned 
more difficult but better than nothing all right for selective mutism better than nothing it's got all of the same things as my AAC which is on my iPad this is a replacement for that so I basically just have to literally look at the things and do, 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 and communicate it's got like on the side it's got little tabs so yeah that is a manual one for I don't know say if my, my iPad broke and it was unusable or I just don't have it with me but this is in my medical bag at all times but I need to work on this so I'm glad I've actually done this video because I'm gonna upgrade it to the new house and some of the changes in conditions that I've got and um, when I'm in hospital it makes it actually easier for the nurse nurses particularly and the doctors and specialists it really does and um, it makes it easier for me because that is saves me on the spot which an autistic cannot do wow I need to get all these things out there communication wise so fast I can't do that we can't do that right we all know that so I hope you've learned something um, now executive functioning is another thing so you know interception is really difficult because particularly with children you need to keep an eye on eating and drinking because they will not know when they're hungry or thirsty um, so that there's and there's many more things please look it up and look into it also executive functioning I have had a lot of regression I blame seizures um, and the MND I really don't know where that's coming from um, it, it feels like a mystery to me but it's here I guess you could blame seizures as well maybe um, because the fact that I had a seizure and then a day or so later I'm having these sudden not remembering things severely um, it could be linked right so that's my my opinion at this point um, I'd have to have a proper conversation with my neuropsych but neuropsychs are um, you know they find it hard too because they deal with neurodivergent people my neuropsych does as well as you know people with MND sorry which is mild neurocognitive um, which is prodomal to dementia so that's what I'm hoping I never get so that's why I have to always be active and functioning and using my brain um, I had a grandfather that had um, oh, I've got cramps sorry Ow. Um, who had dementia so I've worked in a dementia unit myself and um, I watched very fast my father-in-law go downward with dementia from health problems very fast um, and I was very frustrated because I was alarming it to his doctor before and he was one of I guess um, one of the rare ones or uncommon to go that fast but obviously something and it could have been something in his brain it could have been anything it could have been a flu that just hit it off in his in his body and made a storm or something and anyway I knew it was coming because of what I alerted the doctor to but the doctor didn't listen to me of course because I'm just some chick you know I don't know anything so you know dementia is an awful thing um, and I really hope that you know I don't believe that just because I have MND that I'm gonna get it but it is linked it is a prodomal to dementia but the least of my problems at the moment isn't it as you can see Lucy's hanging around for I still got what how many days 20 days I don't know <laughs> but yeah um, at least I got some feedback from my doctor about what we've already seen on it, which in some ways it's like, okay, at least it's showing them where this is, you know, extra problems are coming from with my heart, but at the same time, it's scary. So that's just where I'm at. But look at this. Isn't that awesome?
this is just a cheap little, but it's just a visual stim. I highly recommend visual stims. I've been using a lot more my big one. Um, Galaxy, get one. Absolutely get one. So worth it for unwinding for bedtime. So anyway, I hope you got something out of this autism little, what do you call it? <laughs> Bits and pieces of what your autism is and what the professional names of what you're going through is. And um, I just want to say to anyone who hasn't had a chance to get a diagnosis or Let's just put it this way, I'm trying to be kind because I know that there's a lot of good intending therapists, but in Australia, um, for girls, for autism, they don't get it. And so a lot of girls and women have it and are being told, nah, you know, and particularly because they think it's a trend. Now, yeah, okay, it is. I think some people have labeled themselves with that and it's not that and that's okay because people make mistakes people are just trying to work themselves out but largely majority when they say oh that's that's me i need i need to get they're, they're correct i mean that's what happened for me i did a quiz as a joke and the next minute so it's like no i seriously think you need to get tested and i'm like I won't shut up you know like really me autistic <laughs> as if I'm into university and I how did I survive if I'm autistic um but then when we had a deeper chat and it was like oh no I'm not actually coping with some things in some areas at all it's like and we did a few more quizzes a bit more reading and I was like oh it was actually watching Tony Atwood's ABC piece and it hit hard. Um, I don't know when that was put out, but that really confirmed to me, even when I was in my denial period of after diagnosis, I'm not autistic. Just trying to pretend like I'm not. Like, oh, no, I'm not. Yeah, I am. And now I embrace, since I've embraced it, I am happier, okay? But what I really feel sorry for is people that just don't get the opportunity to get seen properly for what you really are, which is autistic. But also, I want to say to you ADHDers, whether you have both or whether you've just got ADHD, um, we are hard to tolerate. Some people don't like our enthusiasm or our, um, I know, oh my gosh, I'll have to put his name somewhere. It's Connor something, Connor Col Colic or something on TikTok. Super cool dude. He gets the ADHD down pat, and um, <laughs> you know, like he, he'll he'll go outside and he'll sit down with his coffee and get his laptop, and he's obviously got some study to do or something, and you know, he'll spill coffee and he'll be like, oh well, you know, that's it. I'm I'm done. I'm over this. I don't want to do this anymore. It's stupid anyway. What was I even thinking? That, why am I even bothering doing this? That is so true. <laughs> that is so relatable. That is so how my brain operates. If something's not working out, I'm on to the next thing. Like, I need to be efficient. I need to be functional. I need to be perfect at it. I need to be, yeah, it's just... Autism, ADHD and OCD is a really difficult little bundle of joy I am. Anyway, some people appreciate it because we do make good, I don't know, we are fun because we're hyper. But some people are too serious and don't like it. So find your people but I'm just saying be you don't hide the ADHD either don't mask that either um because that's who you are and that's cool because we have different brains screw the normies okay the neurotypical disorder whatever okay I'll catch you in the next video
Thanks guys for listening and I hope you got something because that was my goal to share something. Please comment below if you did learn something. Please let me know because that's my goal. Bye for now. See you in the next next video.